and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest chit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, a man who has the unfortunate misfortune of of putting up with Falcons fans, a a, a man who's been in part of, been part of the Georgia gaming scene since the 80s, and and creator of Encore Kingdom of the Gods, which is which is now kickstarting its um revised slash second edition. The one and only Christopher M. Miller. How you doing today, man? Oh, doing great. Thanks for having me. Thank you, thank you for coming on. Um, thank and thank you again for letting for letting me make um at least one at least one bad joke in, at the start. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be more to come. Oh, I'm sure. Um, I'm sh I'm not even a, I'm not even a parent, and I already know way too many dad jokes. <laughs> Um, but I'd but it's tradition around here to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, with okay. that with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick? Wow. Okay. Uh, well, um, I, you know, I got started in in role playing with with D and D like a lot of folks did. Um, you know, I'm unfortunately old enough uh, to have been around when the game was first in invented. But uh, uh, I, I finally uh, started playing around 1982. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way that I got introduced to it was we had a, a neighbor in the, uh, you know, in, around the block there that had uh, a trampoline in his yard. And so he was very popular. And, uh, you know, back then we, we would go just stay outside all day and, you know, play until the sun went down. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went over there one day and uh, this guy had, uh, he had a bunch of little, you know, metallic miniatures. And, uh, you know, I was uh, very intrigued by all that. And he, he, he didn't have the books on how to play. Um, but we ended up, uh, we had some stickers of the different, from like the monster manual that he had put on flashcards and we ended up kind of making our own uh, card game, if you will, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, of D and D, you know? So we played that for a, you know, a couple of weeks. And then uh, finally I traded a couple of GI Joes for some of his miniatures and uh, was able to figure out where he had bought these. And it was a local gaming store. Uh, so I had my mom, you know, run me down there one weekend and uh, you know, we bought, uh, a couple of the books and a bunch of miniatures and dice and uh you know i'd never seen this kind of stuff before it was all shiny and new and you know so i just uh absorbed all that information and i read those books you know front to back um and e even back then i was kind of a rules lawyer at the <laughs> i was like the 10 year old that knew everything about the game you know mm -hmm. and they had a you know a crappy little storage room in the back of the comic shop that uh they used for uh it was like a break room and they told us you know hey if you want you can play D, &D back there and so uh you know we, we got a group together and uh started playing and we we played uh i mean literally like 12 hours a day every saturday for you know most of my childhood you know mm -hmm. and you know by the time i got into uh you know, college and everything, um, I'd expanded from D and D into playing, uh, other stuff like traveler and, uh, cyberpunk was, was real popular at the time. And, uh, you know, West end games, uh, D six star Wars and mm -hmm. star Trek and, you know, palladium games were, were one of my favorites. So uh, <laughs> but, uh, I liked uh, beyond supernatural and riffs were like my favorite ones, but you know, I, I, I just, uh, I never really stopped gaming. And so, um, in, in fact, up until last year, uh, I had been playing with the same group of people, uh, essentially, that I knew from childhood. So, mm -hmm. 
um, you know, some, some of these people I've, I've been at the table with for 40 years, you know, <laughs> so when it comes, uh, since you mentioned Star Trek, I'd like to, I'd like to go out, I'd like to take a bit of a shot <laughs> in the dark. Um, I'm assuming you're referring to Fossa, um, Star Trek. I, yeah, I think, I think that's what it was. It, it was very similar to Traveler in that, uh, I actually did make a character for Star Trek that died before we started playing. Mm -hmm. he, you know, he, his career was so extensive that he was like 90 years old and uh, and died in some kind of a uh, uh, you know combat action or whatever on a ship. And and then I was like, oh great, and well that took two hours. Now I got to do it again. You know. <laughs> um. Yeah, and I, I ended up do, I ended up doing a bit of a th a bit of a thing because. Um... It's looking back. Looking back at Fossa Star Trek, it's very interesting. Some of the liberties that they had taken, largely because they didn't have a whole lot to work with at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, well, you know, uh, West End Games did the same thing. And oh yeah, although with, um, in fact I, uh, they did they pulled it off so well that Lucas decided to make it canon. So that's re <laughs> that's really the, that's really the difference. Um, Paramount was very hands off. Was very hands off with Fossa until they weren't. Um, and for and the reason and the re and when they decided to be a bit more hands on, they that was when they pulled the license for very dumb reasons, in my in hmm. my opinion. Um, yeah, I don't recall uh, really what any of that. The you know, the be. um. Now the reasoning the reason given depends on who you ask but there were t but there were, there are two things that keep cropping up. One the one one is that apparently they did not care for um Fossa's take on TNG which is um which I find rather suspect. The other is that the, is that they did not care for some of the for some of the setting liberties that they had taken and the fact that Problems could be solved um, via violence instead of playing instead of playing things exactly like they would be on the um, TV right. show. Right. Which, um, if that if that's the case, then why the hell did you ha why the hell did you hire a role playing game company to to um han to handle this? Exactly. exactly. You can't you can't retain that much creative control if you're going to turn it over to every game master in the country who wants to you know make their own uh, not every game master wants to wants to replicate the TV show in fact doing so right. is a waste of potential well and that's that's the thing with any game you know and I, I've said actually I had a conversation about this just today it was like um, you know with, with any role-playing game uh, you can only you know you don't want to railroad people mm -hmm. right and you don't want to do that from a design standpoint or as a GM, and you know every table's going to be a little different. You know, uh, people, the, both the players and the game masters, are going to have their, um, you know, certain things they want to focus on. Um, you know, they've got uh, what they, what whatever situations they personally feel comfortable with, and you know, yada yada yada. Well, you know, you can play Star Trek at at, at ten different. Uh, gaming tables and have ten different experiences, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you're going to have the same vibe. But you know, I mean, heck yeah, some of those games we played back in the you know 80s and 90s. I mean, we played one where we were all Klingons, <laughs> and uh, it was markedly more uh, you know uh, combat heavy and, <laughs> and violent than than I think the series ever was. You know, so, um, but you know, that's that's your prerogative, you know, whatever you want to do with it. You can't, I, you know, if somebody wants to take my game and, and go in a, a slightly different direction with it, I mean, that's, as long as they buy the book, <laughs> you know, they can do what they want with it. Mm -hmm. um, now, you, can't, you contrast that with the relationship that um, Lucas Books had with, um, with the Star Wars D6 uh, project, where... Yeah. They were were they were collaborating they were co they were collaborating with each other a lot. A lot of the stuff that was introduced in those D six books became canon. And um, the story goes that when Timothy Zahn was writing the Thrawn trilogy, um, Lucas Books sent him several of the RPG books as um, research aids. Mm 
That's right. That's right. Well, you know, and, and here's the thing. Lucas absolutely wrote the, the, the first trilogy as he went along. You know, I, I know that all this, uh, you know, there's all this talk about, oh, well, he had six movies planned and this and that and the other. I mean, if you watch, <laughs> he, if that you watch whole, old that, movies, that whole thing of him having of him having a long term plan like that, like that, yeah. I know for a fact that's bullshit. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's total BS. The I, I I've seen him in multiple interviews that were uh, done, you know, back in the seventies. And it was very clear he didn't know what was going to happen in, in Empire Strikes Back. So, you know, he was he was writing these things as he went along, and he left a lot of plot holes, and he left a lot of things kind of unanswered uh, that weren't really, I mean, in, in his defense, it wasn't all that important for telling that particular story in the films. But, um, you know, all the finer points that you kind of need to know in a uh, role-playing setting... Uh, you just weren't there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when uh, when the guys got together and started uh, doing the D6 Star Wars, they, they filled in the blanks. And uh, I think he was just really impressed with their creativity and the way that they, you know, came up with uh, plausible answers for stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and, and why not? You know, um, you know, Gary Gygax was the same kind of way. Uh, you know, if you had a, a chance to talk to him, you know, before he passed, he, he would always tell you, um, you know, he somebody would come to him with a question, and he would he would say, "Well, how would you handle it? What would you have done?" You know, he wouldn't he wouldn't give the answer because he didn't know the answer. You know, um, he also uh, intended Dungeons and Dragons to be kind of left open for interpretation. You know, depending on who who's at the table. So, mm -hmm. well. Um, he himself, uh, funny enough, uh, had his own set of house rules uh, that contradicted a lot of the rules in the book that he wrote. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, uh, that's that's also what that's also why I um, I've I've poked fun, I've poked fun at the at the old school crowd in one in one form or another when when I see when I see these lengthy ad, I see these lengthy explanations about what was intended when it came to this or that rule. For the for the book, and, and I'm like, you do real you do realize everybody at TSR was just flying by the seat of their pants, right? Right. I mean, they were total drifters. I mean, <laughs> it's just you know, but I mean, in a respectful way, I, you know, I say that. But I'm, I'm just, uh, they were like you said, they were they were making it up as they went along. They were flying by the seat of their pants, and mm -hmm. somehow uh, that game in particular, more so than others, just seemed to gel with the most people and. And it became the uh, you know the thing it did. Mm -hmm. uh, you but, know it, it 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 wasn't even really the first role playing game uh, in you know per se, but um, it it was the one that uh, you know was able to get the most traction and and through Gary and and his way of uh, you know marketing and and creating conventions and whatnot to to help promote that. I mean it it worked. Mm -hmm. Um. I also, I, as an aside, I do find it a bit amusing that you brought up um, rifts as one as one of the, as one of your early excursions um, outside mm -hmm. outside of D and D because um, all critics have their whipping boys and um, the Palladium system has been mine for over twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I well, I talked. You know, I, nobody likes it. I don't know why. I um. I mean, they, they look. They got a they got a fan page on Facebook, mm -hmm. you know, that I'm a member of. But uh, trust me, outside of like those 300 people, there's probably uh, very few that like it. Um, you know, I um, I don't know. I just felt what it was. You know, at the time, it was very different than D and D. Mm -hmm. um, I personally thought that it was a very simple system to kind of pick up, and I liked the fact that. It didn't matter whether you played Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or Beyond Supernatural or Rifts or Palladium Ninja, Fantasy. Ninja they all, Super Spice. They were all, they were all interchangeable. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he had supplements he came out with with uh, you know that would have all the weapons in the entire universe essentially that you know anything you, any kind of weapon you could think of. Mm -hmm. And you could 
take the stats for that weapon and use it in any game. And, and, and for Rifts in particular, that worked because you could have, you know, medieval knights fighting, uh, you know, on dragons fighting uh, helicopters or something. And um, so I, I just thought it was um, I, uh... very, very complete. Versus, you know, it, it seemed like he did a lot of work on it. You yeah, know? I um, I will I will freely admit that a big part of the reason why I give um, Palladium a lot of shit is I'm very big on navigation, <laughs> mm. and um, there's the infamous um table of contents issues that Palladium's books had <laughs> for years. Yeah, well, and uh, I tell you the truth, I don't. I didn't really bother with the table of contents very much. I just kind of, uh, I'd read the book completely, and then I kind of memorized where everything was. And, um, and then one, like I said, once you kind of pick it up, like you could play, you know, Heroes Unlimited was another one, right? So, I mean, but you could, once you kind of got the basic rules for Palladium, you could play any genre you wanted. You didn't even have to really look at the book because the rules were all the same. Yeah. Um, but... Moving moving past all that, how did um how did the idea for Encore first come up? Because jumping jumping between those disparate games into into <laughs> and into developing an RPG that is um ha- that is ha- that has these very pulp science fantasy elements with a lot of yeah. um, nods to um the mythologies of the Fertile Crescent. Yeah, it's uh man, that's a it's a psychedelic trip. Uh, I- the journey I'm going to take you on here. Now, I, I uh, it started way back. I don't know, uh, 2003 or 2004. Mm-hmm. Um, I and, and let me preface this by saying I never uh, thought I was going to create a, a role playing game. You know, other than uh, in the back of your mind, I think everybody who plays these games, you know, kind of thinks, and you know, oh, I, I could do that. You know. Uh, not knowing anything about how difficult it actually is, um, but you know, I was uh, I was working in the medical field with my wife, and uh, we were both um, at a at a doctor's office up in Emory, and um, you know, I I was getting I was kind of uh, having a midlife crisis, if you will, and uh, mm-hmm. was just very happy at my job, and you know, when you're going through something like that, uh, a lot of times you kind of think to yourself like what you know what else would i do um you know i'm middle-aged at this point do i want to try to re-educate myself and go back to school or pick up some you know manual labor job or something a construction worker or something that just you know pays decent but uh, would probably suck um you know what what kind of skills do i have to fall back on mm-hmm. and uh you know i i thought well if there was anything that i if i if if I had a choice and I could do anything that I wanted, and money wasn't an issue, uh, I said, you know, I'd always like to make my own uh, role playing game. And uh, I said, well, I've I played enough of them, that's for sure, and I've been doing this my entire life. I mean, if anybody could, you know, I mean, I, I bet I could do it. And so I had saved up, you know, some money, and uh, I went ahead and quit my job at that time and um you know my wife and i uh kind of put our finances together and and you know kind of started funding this this idea that that snowballed into uh, a much larger project because initially it was it was kind of a um a setting that i was intending on using for you know d20 um and at the time, this is this is going back when like uh, D twenty just came up for like open license, and uh, or not just then. I think that happened in two thousand. But anyway, by two thousand three, uh, they were having issues though because uh, uh, Watsi had had uh, you know bought the you know what was it uh, Hasbro had bought Watsi, and so they were kind of. Uh, not honoring a lot of the open license agreements and they were getting very litigious and suing people. And a, actually a buddy of mine uh, who, who was doing the same thing, he was uh, making his own game, uh, got a cease and desist from Hasbro 
uh, for something that had previously been approved by Watsi. So um, I just decided at that point uh, not to even touch the D20 system. And I was going to have to make, you know, my own system from scratch. Well, I just, I didn't know how to do that, you know. <laughs> so, and I didn't even really have a setting. Um, at the time, I was working mostly on the mechanics, and I was, it was just kind of a basic uh, D&D setting, you know, it was a medieval fantasy or something. And um, a, a buddy of mine turned me on to the uh, the History Channel and, uh, you know, the, the whole Ancient Aliens show, which had just started, you know, uh, airing. So, man, I watched... Uh, every episode of that and I bought a bunch of books and started reading into it, you know, and I just got super interested in it. And it was only, you know, within a couple of weeks, I was like, you know what, this is, this is the setting that I'm going to do. Um, there's nothing like this, you know, currently out there. Um, you know, certain games touch on ancient Sumerian stuff, uh, we, with call of Cthulhu or, um, even riffs or something like that to an extent. Uh, you know, it's kind of used in a lot of, um, occult scenarios and that sort of thing but uh but there's never been a, a kind of a dedicated sumerian mythology setting and a lot of the ancient aliens uh episodes focused on you know the ancient mythologies uh, from around the world that that all kind of dealt with the ancient aliens uh theory but uh the sumerians in particular kind of you know popped out and uh they seem to have uh, the most extensive records on that sort of thing, right? So uh, I really got into that, and I decided, once I decided that that was going to be my setting, um, everything else just kind of started falling into place. And, you know, the uh, Sumerians were, were big into numerology and that sort of a thing, and, and the number 12 uh, was, was sacred to them. And so uh, because of that, I decided to use a D12. And... I wasn't sure how how I was going to make that work, you know, but uh, it it didn't work when I tried to do it the same way that D20 works. But as soon as I got my mind out of that, you know, the confines of of what what makes a D20 system, um I started thinking outside the box and I said, "Well, instead of rolling high with difficulty numbers, why don't I uh have, you know, stats and skill levels that add together to form a target number. And you have to roll not higher than that, but lower than that, you know? Um, and then once I, once I got my head around that kind of a, you know, it just, like I said, it all kind of came together. Um, and this, you know, I did like 10 years worth of play testing and demos and stuff at conventions. And, um, eventually, uh, you know, I, I heard of this thing called Kickstarter and, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, I put a, a crappy little video together and a, and a page for that. And to my surprise, it, it funded. And so, um, uh, you know, then I had the responsibility of actually, uh, fulfilling it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I was obligated to make a book at that point, you know, were you, that's, were that's you, how it um, came. Were you from, were you familiar at all with, um, with the with the concept of rolling under before before this, or um, was no. was this your first foray into that into that idea? No, I, I had never even considered it to be honest. And uh, you know, I was at I was at somebody's house. It was um, it was some Muggle friend of mine who you know wasn't a gamer. And I don't remember what it was. We were playing Yahtzee or something, some, you know, lame uh, game that had some dice or something that you, you know, and it was one of these, uh, I don't recall what it was, but it was something that, you know, it had a similar mechanic. It was like um, you had to roll low, but but you wanted to roll high as, as possible, but lower than the other person or something like that. That doesn't and sound that, like Yahtzee. Yeah, no, no, but it, but it was something that stuck in my head, and I said, you know what? Um, I think I should try something like that, you know. And and I just uh, I I worked at it for a couple of weeks, I think, before I really, you know, got it down, uh, you know, perfectly. Um, 
but you know that was the the biggest struggle was was trying to figure out how how not how to not make a d20 game you know what i mean mm-hmm. <laughs> uh i didn't want it to be um a d20 D D clone or something and um you know and i think i succeeded i you know it's uh it's definitely unique and um it works um i do have uh my my critics on that matter. I, I had a guy just today uh, tell me that it's impossible to, uh, you know, have a a, a fair um, uh, what, what do you call it? you know like a a, a range of uh, bell curve. Yeah, yeah, like a bell curve or something on a D twelve. And I, I said, well, you know what? That's um, how do you do you have the same opinion on uh, games that use D four or D six or D ten? You know, and I think everybody is so biased towards a twenty-sided die that they can't conceive anything else as being as good. Um, and uh, you know, the, ba- the so the basic mechanic for the game, and I'll explain it here is uh, you've you've got stat numbers that range from one to five. Okay, mm-hmm. so we're not de- we're not dealing with Dungeons and Dragons where your stat is between one and twenty. Okay. So the, the stat range is, is much shorter. Uh, and the reason I did that is because, again, in Dungeons & Dragons, you, you know, the only the top four or five numbers mean anything. Everything else is average, right? So, or, or uh, below average. But, um, you know, depending on what edition of the game you play, um, you know, anything basically from like a 3 to a 14 or 3 to 13 is you know, considered uh, quote unquote average uh, and certainly would would miss uh, if you were rolling to hit, you know, a lot of times. Right. So uh, I said, well, so what, what's the point in having such a broad range of numbers if there's only five numbers that would ever do you any good? You know, um, and so I, 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 that's why I decided to just make my stat range one through five. Um, and then you also have uh, you don't have class levels in my game, but you have mm-hmm. skill level. Mm-hmm. And so I I decided you would add the skill level to your corresponding stat for that skill, and that creates what I call an action potential number or an APN. Mm-hmm. That's your target number, and you want to roll that number or less on a D12, and that's it, right? But um, now if you roll the exact APN, that's a crit. If you roll a one, a one is always a success, but never a critical success. Mm-hmm. A 12 is always a critical failure. Now, people are like, oh, well, what if you get, you know, a, a plus 10, you know, magical bonus to something? I said, well, first of all, there's no magic in my game. But, uh, and, and there's very rare cases where you would get any kind of bonuses, uh, certainly in the plus 10 range, you know. Uh, but assuming that you did, uh, you would count upwards from one, right, for your APN. Uh, you know, let's say you had an APN, uh, a normal APN of like a, a two. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you add 10 to that, and that's going to make it 12. Well, you can't be a 12 because a 12 is always a failure. So you count up to 11, and then you count backwards whatever overage amount, which is just one point. And then that's your, it, it just increases your critical threshold. So, you know, you could have a plus 20 to something, and a 12 is always going to be a critical failure, but your crit range is just going to be increased, you know, from instead of 11, uh, you know, it might be a, a 5 or, or a 2 or whatever it is. It can never be a 1, though, because a 1 can never be a critical success. Mm-hmm. So you can actually handle... Um, you know, rather large bonuses up to up to twenty points or something on a D twelve, if you if you use it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think a lot of people mistakenly assume that a D twelve can't handle you know a broad enough range of numbers. And uh, if you do it that way, it can. And <clears throat> I um I remember here. When it came to that whole, when it came to that whole thing of oh you can't oh you can't use a d12 or something like that I'm like first off the d12 is the lonely dice even even with 
even among even among my um my library it's right not, it's not that it's not that um it's not that i don't have games that it's not that i don't have games that use it it's that it's that it it's that it gets used less often to the point where i um as a joke i wrote a script for a for a um P, for a psa style vid, style video like the like those um like those sad puppy videos that that would always show that would always show up as ad, a de, a, for just for just five cents a day you too can adopt you too can adopt a lonely d12 <laughs> right the, because the lonely d12 had become had been a running had been a running gag um at my at my table so i just made it into a i just made it into a full thing where i asked um i asked the guy i asked one of my buddies to um queue up in the arms of the angels and then i just improvised the rest <laughs> just just because just because um we were playing a beer and pretzels kind of kind of game so i fi i figured why i figured why not fuck around um Half orc barbarians everywhere, you know, cried that day, um, yeah. yeah, with their with their battle axes. Um, yeah. but you know, I've um, I remember hearing something similar in a, in a critique of a of a game that um is roll under but uses a d twenty in um Fading Suns. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and for some, I've never played Fading Suns, and uh, my mechanic gets compared to that all the time, and in. in uh, sometimes in a disparaging way, and I don't understand uh, why. But uh, like I, I said, I, I think it, it. You know, this one guy I talked to uh, today. Um, you know wh what he had to say on it. Uh, unfortunately, was a little misinformed because he had never read uh, the entirety of the uh, of the rules. You know, so uh, you know, just on the face of it, he he thought, oh well. If you're going to get the if you if you've got the stat range that you would have in D and D and you've got the bonuses and you know uh, feats and magical bonuses and things you might have from D and D and tried to apply it to a D twelve oh it would never work you know well you're right it, using a D twelve in in that system in D and D would not work but you're not my, doing my, that well I'm not doing that it's a different thing and so it it. Sometimes it's a little hard for people to, uh, you know, kind of get their head around. But um, it's, uh... I, um, I at, at my L, at my LGS for a few for quite a few years, um, I would run one shots of of various games, and um, some and sometimes there sometimes there would be the, there would be um, a certain punishment that you'd have to do if you said something sufficiently stupid that we called the pain glass. Um, <laughs> It sounds ominous. Yeah. Well, um, you. This usually happened if either a you got caught cheating or b you asked the DM, which is which more often than not was me, a question that was sufficiently stupid or or is the kind of thing that got you death stares from everybody else at the table. Um, <laughs> one particular okay. inst one particular instance, um, I was setting up um, Earth Dawn. For, and I and whenever I do these kind of things, I always have I always have a primer on the basic of the basics of the rules, and um a f and a few pregens. And okay, there was one and there was and one person asked, okay, who, okay, who's gonna be, okay, who, which one of you is gonna be the healer? You know, as you know, as if we were do as if we were doing um traditional uh, classes. Yeah, yeah. And I and um, I had I had immediately said, oh. Okay, you okay? Pick option A or option B because you've got the because before we even start, you got to go through the pain glass. <laughs> <laughs> now, option A is a shot glass filled with um, water, salt, um, sea salt, black pepper, ground up jalapeno seeds, oh Tabasco gosh. sauce, tiger sauce, Frank's red hot sauce, and sriracha. And you just have this lying around. I um I had I made I always make sure to ha I always make sure to have a bit of it prepared in the back. Yeah. Because, okay. You made um, it, anticipating something. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know you know how it is. Measure twice, cut once. <laughs> but the option B, which arguably is worse, is you have to drink a whole bottle of bacon soda. Oh man. That's B A C O N soda. 
Yeah. It's as it's as rancid as it sounds. Oh. Oh. Um, I ended up getting it by accident at at a at a at a candy store at a candy store in downtown St. <laughs> Paul, and um, then I realized, you know what? This will be great. This will be really good torture. Um, in more recent <laughs> years, I um, I had set I had set up a I I had taken a cue from Wayne's World, and I had set I had set up a a sign on the wall that says "Absolutely no critical role" because I was sick of people bringing bringing that up when it came to <laughs> questioning my decisions. So I was like. So, so, so I would just, I would just cut them off and then point at the sign, you know, like the whole right. no stairway to heaven sign in the movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but truth be told, when I was first introduced to, uh, to Encore, um, it was brought up to, it was brought up to me in a, um, for, in a forum that I've long since been banned from because I apparently was, I apparently was a naughty boy. Um. No. I was uh, I was asking for game I was asking for games that had something close to a John Carter like aesthetic. Oh yeah, definitely. And um, obvious obvious now um that my uh, nowadays if I ask that people will say well yeah well there's well Modifus has the John as the John Carter name but that wasn't yeah, the no. case at the time. This was years before that. Right. And um, or at the and on and encore was um was pointed out to me and i ended up look, taking one look at the cover where you have this mix of sf weaponry with um with a ver with a very mid east mid eastern flavor and i'm like yep this will do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, yeah I, I was very uh i was very pleased with uh you know jason judah uh was the artist who did the the cover mm -hmm. and uh, and a lot of the interior artwork too um and uh, you know, I, I I was very pleased with a lot of what what he was able to come up with, and uh, you know, my uh, ramblings and musing <laughs> musings on what I thought the cover should look like must have sounded like a madman, you know. But uh, I um, uh, basically based it on uh, an old uh, Dio cover. So like, <laughs> if you're familiar with like heavy metal, the the other. Oh thing. yeah. <laughs> so so there's a. a you know, a band called Dio, mm -hmm. uh, Ronnie, Ronnie James Dio. I am very and, familiar with Dio, and so uh, I think the, I think it was their last in line album, mm -hmm. and it it's got like a pyramid in the background and all these people kind of running, uh, you know, for their lives, and there's like a demon uh, in the foreground, and uh, behind him is this uh, bright light. It looks kind of like a sun or something, and then the hint of uh, a couple of moons or planets or something in the, in the sky. And I thought, man, that's, uh, that rocks, you know, so I got to do something similar to that. You know, I, I want, I, how can I sum up everything in a cover, you know, that like, I need a pyramid. I need, uh, you know, something to denote like a sci-fi element to it, you know, and, uh, the fact that, you know, the earth, uh, in my game, uh, you know, 30, uh, 30,000 years ago had two moons mm -hmm. and you know so I, ju I just tried to I, I threw the kitchen sink at him and said you know uh, put all this in a picture yeah um, uh, but I think he did a great job yeah mm -hmm. and um how how can I get how can I get all of that in, how can I get all of that in the cover um all of a sudden Drew Struzan enters the chat <laughs> 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 which um for the record, Stru Drew Struzan is um, responsible for all of the posters for the for the um, for the Star for the Star Wars and Indiana Jones movies. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, there the was definitely there was definitely an element to that too because I I did ask him when he initially posed the the three figures that are on the cover. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't in their original positions, and I and I said, well, um. I like it, but can you? I almost want I want it to evoke kind of a Star Wars feel, or almost like a Charlie's Angels deal, where you got the three people and kind of their backs to each other and they're facing in different directions and that whole deal. And uh, and so he did that, and you know, so there you have it. But yeah, yeah, definitely that was an influence too. Mm -hmm. Now, with the. Now, with that kind of th with that kind of thing in mind, since you mentioned that 
th that this is going to be uh, that this is going to be skip that um encore's setup is um skill based um yeah this brings me to this brings me to a question that i've that i've mm -hmm. asked uh, that i've asked others because um with a lot of rpgs that re that rely heavily on skills they tend to have a lot of them and there tends to be the pattern of um Here's a few skill points. Um, spend, here's a few skill points. Spend on spend on what you want and um, swim. Damn it. Um, yeah. Um, the, I, the phrase that I've often used is um, analysis paralysis. And um, as much as I enjoy the game, Shadowrun is one of the bigger offenders when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, yeah. Is that is that something that you've been made aware of when it comes to your experiences with Encore? And how do you um? How do you make how do you make sure that somebody isn't overwhelmed when it comes to um skill use? Yeah, well, you know, I I have had uh one or two people that you know, one of my uh regular players actually um had complained that it was a little overwhelming for them. Uh but you know, I mean, I think that person and one other person mentioned something about it in in 10 years, you know. So, I don't know, but uh, I will admit there are uh, a fair number of skills. I mean, there's a whole chapter on skills, and so it takes up 50 pages or something, right? You know, um, there, you know, there's a uh, quite a number of different casts. And so I, I I call them casts instead of classes, um, and I, that harkens back to uh, you know Sumerian mythology or Sumerian culture but uh, also Hindu culture and, and ancient Egyptian as well. So, you know, they all had caste systems. And I thought those were a little more appropriate than just calling them professions or classes, you know, because they they really did kind of um, uh, take over, a, you know, take a life of their own. It was like, um, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times you'd be born into a profession and you would train, a, you know, in a guild and spend your formative years, uh, you know, uh, becoming a, an, you know, an apprentice and all this. And so uh, I, there's a heavy element of, uh, of that in the game where you, you know, it's a guild system and, and uh, different casts and things have different advantages and disadvantages. But uh, so the, the way I tried to mitigate the problem you're talking about is um, each cast has a set of like core curriculum. Okay. Um, and because it's a sci-fi game, and the Sumerians, you know, uh, mention in in their writings that uh, the gods gave them these boxes that would speak to them and teach them the ways of civilization. So, you know, if you wanted to to learn blacksmithing, you would go to the temple and speak to the box that contained all the information. And so I thought, well, as hell, that sounds like a computer, you know. <laughs> so uh, in the game, I've got these computers that um, are very rare. And uh, they're on, you know, they're, they're basically, uh, they run on like a crystal technology. So, so sort of like the old Superman movie where you take like a crystal and insert it in the computer. And it, it, it will show a, a projection of someone, you know, teaching a class on, you know, basket weaving or whatever, right? Um, mm -hmm. Now, these are highly sought after, and the different guilds each control um, a certain amount of these computers and, and, and the discs and things that go with them, and you know, the or the crystals. Mm -hmm. And so, um, they'll even uh, sometimes steal from each other or have wars, you know, like city-states will fight each other, uh, to, to possess the, you know, supercomputer that, that tells you how to make a nuclear bomb, you know? So, um, you know, and if you take, if you, if you sneak into one city and take their computer that teaches them blacksmithing, then now that city's, you know, uh, they don't have blacksmithing anymore, except for the people who already know it. Right. So, um, so with, with that in mind, um, there are a ton of skills, but you're, I don't want to say you're limited because I mean, they're, you know, but you, you have a curriculum 
you're, you're limited to a certain extent as to which uh, categories of skills you're allowed to pick from. And mm -hmm. uh, skills are kind of expensive, uh, not not at first, but see, you're paying for each level of skill. And uh, even at the character creation, you can start at a higher skill level than one. Uh, it's actually uh, the maximum is whatever your um, intelligence uh, stat is, uh, I think is what I did. So the, um, you know, so you could, you could potentially have a pretty high intelligence and start with a level four skill in something or, you know, but um, that being said though, you know, every time you buy it, it's more expensive and you only, you know, you've got a finite amount of points to spend in, in character creation. So uh, I, I find a lot of people tend to have six to 10 skills. Um, and depending on how good they want to be at something, you know, you've got people that want to be jacks of all trades and they'll have 10 skills and they're all pretty low. Or you got that one guy that, no, oh, I'm just going to choose, you know, three different fighting styles and, and I'm going to throw in it and, and he's a, a tank, you know. So, uh, you know, like I said, there, it, it's, it's mitigated, I think, by the availability of the skills for the different casts and then the cost of the skills. Um, but you, you know... You may want to pick a bunch. Yeah, you know, I've I've had people that say, "Well, I I don't know which one of these to get." You know, and and you know, and there's I think that happens with any game. Um, now that that being said, though, I will preface too that the, I do have a mechanic in there that allows you to learn any simple skill uh, through trial and error. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you know, I, I categorize skills as being either simple or complex. And the reason I do that is um, a lot of the complex skills have prerequisites that are simple skills. So you need to learn basic math before you can learn how to you know, program a computer. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't self-teach yourself how to program a computer when you you don't know the first thing about computers. So... Uh, you know, I, I thought it would be a good idea to um, and some of the classes for you know, past for some examples. Uh, uh, I mean, basically all their skills are simple. Um, the the Naru, who are you know your entertainers, you know, the gladiators, actors, musicians, prostitutes, that kind of a thing. Um, they almost all of their skills are simple skills. Um, you know, nothing real complex, but then you get to like the, the Dubsar and the Dubsar are scribes. Um, and, and by design, they are the only ones that the alien overlords allow to learn how to read and write. Uh, they're the liaison between the gods and the humans. And, um, and they fill this, uh, this role as kind of arbiters and, you know, judges and, uh, you know, cartographers and diplomats and, and that sort of a thing. So they, they have kind of an elevated role in society. Uh, and a lot of their skills are actually complex skills because they deal with uh, a lot of mathematics and, uh, you know, uh, some even you can get into like some meta metaphysical stuff. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you got the Shadim who are essentially engineers and, and almost all their skills are, uh, you know, based on, uh, you know, technology and, and, and that sort of a thing. So again, uh, their skills are going to be mostly complex as well. Um, and, and again, that's by design because they don't want, you know, they being the, both the aliens and these other guilds, they don't want, um, you know, people from the Naru Guild or people from the Garadum Guild, which is the, you know, the soldiers, uh, they don't want them just going over and and learning how to build uh, spaceships or computers or something, right? You know, uh, they want to make it hard for them to, to comprehend those kind of things, so they don't give them the prerequisites to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and like I said, that's where the whole caste system kind of comes in. You know, if you're bred 
uh, to be a fighter, then, you know, that's kind of, you know, you're just there to, uh, you know, break necks and cash checks and that kind of thing. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, and, and it doesn't mean that your character has to be unintelligent. It, it just means that the skills available to you in your profession are all going to be simple skills. And you have no need, uh, but also have no ability, <laughs> uh, at least legally, uh, to learn these other skills. So, uh, in a way, I think that it creates checks and balances on its own because you're, like I said, you're 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 not going to have uh, 50 pages worth of skills to choose from. Mm-hmm. Based on your, based on your cast, you, you know, you may only have 20 skills to choose from and uh you know enough points to to only make five or six of them any good you know so uh, i think it works out Mm -hmm. now one of the other things that's on that's on the bullet points on the kicks on the kickstarter is uh is what you refer to as gritty realistic combat um there's been plenty there's been plenty of attempts to do this to do this kind of thing some of them some of them go heavy on the charts some of them some of them go heavy on um the detail in other in other forms um how do you ma- how do you maintain th- how do you maintain that while at the same time not making it too hard for yeah. um ca- for characters well i i don't know that i do <laughs> so uh, what I mean by that is um, I don't pull any punches with combat because I'm not a big fan of, uh, in, per- in particular, what they're doing with, you know, 5th uh, edition D&D and, 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 and well, what they have done, though, for a while is um, come up with, like, threat ratings and hit dice levels for monsters and that sort of a thing, right, so that you know going into a situation whether or not your party should be able to overcome that situation. Um, that's not realistic. You know, in real life, um, you know, fuck around and find out, right? It's kind of... <laughs> uh, you, if you go to, to kill this dragon, uh, you, have, you should have no idea whether you're going to easily be successful or not, you know, other than you might be confident in your skills. But... Um, I, you know, I think you should have to, uh, you know, kind of uh, tough it out and see, you know. And, and and it's perfectly acceptable if you get into a bad combat, you have to, you know, pull out and run away to fight another day. I mean, that's that's uh, something that might happen. But I don't, I don't make combats or or scenarios with the specific intent of, of, Oh, the PCs should be able to do, you know, to do this easily. You know, I, I let the players make decisions and if they do something kind of rash or stupid that might get them killed, I mean, you know, that might happen, but, um, combat in the game is, uh, it can be deadly because there's no magical healing. Uh, there's no healing potions per se. There, there are mana potions and or mana elixirs um but all that does is double or in some cases triple your natural healing rate and the natural healing rate is just one point you know per day so if you lose you know 30 uh you know wound points or something uh it's going to take a month you know to heal from that um and under the best circumstances, it might take half a month, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, now, that's something that, obviously, you're not going to role play, you know, out, you know, through multiple sessions. Okay, yeah, you're still in the hospital. Uh, what do you guys do while you're in bed, you know? I mean, the, you're, you're going to just uh, jump ahead and, and say, okay, 30 days went by, and, you know, here's what you can do next. But, um, but I think players have to be a little more careful because you can't just go into a situation uh, weapons flailing and assume you're going to come out. Okay. You know, a a well-placed, you know, sword strike or, 
or certainly some of the alien weapons that, you know, ray guns and that sort of thing, I mean, could potentially kill you in one hit. Um, I think on average, you know, uh, like four really good, you know, four good hits on somebody could kill them. So uh, now there's a, that's another thing too, you know, characters are, you're allowed to attempt either a dodge or a parry on every strike. So uh, you may not be good at that, but you get a, a roll. Um, and then you do have karma points. Um, karma points are something that I, I decided to put in there um, that allows you know players to kind of uh, manipulate their roles a little bit. So uh, you know maybe you you know you don't want your character to die. You're in a situation where you know you you tried you know somebody swung at you. You you're, you failed your uh, dodge or whatever. Um, you could use a karma point to re-roll your failed, you know, dodge, or you could use two karma points to automatically succeed at them, mm -hmm. or you could use three karma points to automatically succeed and crit. And so, you know, obviously, well, a crit wouldn't make much sense in the de defensive uh, stance, but, but if you were attacking someone, for example, you could use that too. Um, I also have uh, stamina points that everybody gets. You have physical and spiritual stamina points and the stamina points can be used um to increase your amount of effort in something and so if you really want to make sure that uh that you dodge or parry you could add stamina to that and you know increase your uh, your chances you could do the same thing if you were attacking someone or, or what have you so there's various different kind of ways you can um you know uh, get yourself out of a mess but but also with combat i have a a pretty extensive um uh critical uh critical failure and critical success table so uh this was something that, like way way back in the day when i uh i played hack master in the mm -hmm. 80s and i just i loved rolling on those tables and you know uh, finding out that i had a severed artery or a broken leg or you know broken rib or something you know so uh, I decided to do something similar, and so if uh, somebody crits against you, it's it's not going to be good. <laughs> you know, uh, a broken bone could take six weeks to heal. So uh, you know, you want to try to avoid that. And so, uh, you know, combat in real life, combats are typically short, and uh, and real combats tend to be. A huge exchange of misses followed by blocks and parries and different things like that, right? Mm -hmm. And then the first person to strike and actually hit, you know, land a blow is, is I mean, that is the one to win usually. Um, you know, in, in real life, um, you know, because I've, I've uh, taken kendo before and I used to be in that, the SCA and I've done a lot of LARPing and things like that. Now, let me tell you, even in a LARP, where you've got hit points and, you know, fake armor and all that. Um, it's mostly people swinging and missing or people, uh, you know, blocking and parrying and stuff. And then if you get one or two good hits on somebody, they're usually down, you know. Um, and that's how it, yeah, that's how it kind of should be, to be honest. I mean, if you think about it, if I shot you with a with a gun, how many shots in the chest could you take before you went down? Well, probably just one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, you think realistically, right? <laughs> I mean, so even if you're a, uh, a quote unquote hero, you know, let's say Arnold Schwarzenegger burst through my door and I shot him in the chest. I mean, he's going down. I don't care how strong he is, you know. So um, I think, you know, real world physics was was kind of something I tried to focus on and, mm -hmm. and just make sure that, um, you know, listen, uh, it, it, you know, we have muskets in the game. You know, they're, they're like, uh, they're called bandooks. And, uh, you know, if, if somebody fired a 50 caliber musket at you and it hit you, I mean, it was, it'd take your arm off, you know. So uh, that mm -hmm. is something that could happen. <laughs> so just try not to get in those situations or, or try to use cover to your advantage or, uh, you know, really make sure that you're using stamina and or your uh, karma points correctly so that you can avoid those kind of things, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and don't make stupid decisions. Yeah. And 
the, now when it comes when it comes to when it comes to basing um your set your setting on I'd I'd say um I'd say you lean more towards Sumeria than e than Egypt if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Now there's there's a little bit you know I I focus per, well, okay, so I wrote another I wrote another book called Ankur Land of the First People. Mhm. Mm and that one is based on uh, the mythology of ancient Africa. And um, uh, obviously going into that, I <laughs> initially I thought I would just do something on Egypt and, uh, you know, uh, maybe the, the uh, West African cultures, uh, you know, Ghana or something. And, and, uh, and it snowballed into this uh, huge project. But anyway, uh, Egypt is listed in great detail in, in that book. Um, and so there is definitely, excuse me, uh, definitely an, an element of Egyptian mythology in the game world. Um, I tried to touch on every major civilization to some extent. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I traveled through India when I was younger and, um, spent a lot of time, uh, you know, with the, the Indian people. Uh, in in my uh, neighborhood here, you know, actually Atlanta has a, a very large Hindu population, and so mm -hmm. um, I, I was able to, you know, learn a, 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 probably just as much about their culture, if not more so than than the Sumerians, and um, you know, so I, I definitely added uh, things like you know Vimana, uh, which is you know my name for all the alien spacecraft, UFOs, and things like that in the game. Uh, and so you have various different classes of Vimana, you know, some that are aquatic and some that fly in the air and some that, you know, roll on wheels on the ground like cars uh, and that sort of thing. So, But, but yeah, I, I, uh, I'd say, yeah, it's definitely got a, a heavy slant towards the uh, Sumerian stuff for sure. Mm-hmm. And with that kind of, with that kind of thing in mind, um, was it was was it? Re I'd like you to walk me through what it, what it was like um, doing research on on that on that for for a setting where you're taking that and bringing in a little bit of um, pul of pulp SF into it. Yeah. Well, um, you know, with with all of I I knew going into it, uh, any of this could be kind of a sensitive topic to somebody um, because of a lot of, you know, what we consider ancient mythologies, um, you know, people in, in those regions may still consider, uh, you know, their religion or, or you know, uh, true stories and not, not so much uh, the fantasy that we kind of make it out to be. Um, and so I, I, I tried to, use kid gloves and just kind of really look at this from a, uh, uh, an aspect of, well, let me, let me take it at face value. Right. So I'm reading all this, uh, stuff about the Sumerians and, and about, um, you know, even the Mesoamerican cultures and ancient Egypt and, you know, Hinduism. And, uh, you know, I, I said, well, let me just approach it from, I'm going to assume that everything that they say in these in these books and in the, you know, these scripts is true. You know, I'm just going to take it verbatim. Mm -hmm. If they say that the sky people, you know, came down in a silver ship shaped like a shield and, you know, they took all the women from the village, <laughs> you know, and uh, they, they uh, you know, uh, the, the people you know, marked this day, you know, by, by this uh, particular, you know, celebration or something afterwards for, for hundreds of years, you know, I'm just, go I'm going to not, you know, yeah, I'm not going to be like a, a modern uh, historian or scientist and say, Oh, well, that was allegory or something like that. I'm going to say, well, no, they said a silver UFO came down and took, took everybody out of the village or whatever. Right. So I, uh, I just kind of took, this very realistic approach to everything and um 
and and in particular with the stuff with with Africa, because you know you've got a lot of those countries now that um, that still practice uh, you know the belief systems that uh, you know that go back thousands of years that I describe in the book, mm-hmm. and so uh, I I tried to uh, like I said if anything I just tried to present that material as given by them as though it were true, and so. You know, uh, having done that, I, uh, if anything, I'm the strongest proponent of of their beliefs and and not uh, appropriating anything. You know, if I can you know, say that. So, um, you know, I don't know if that answered uh, your question or if it was a uh, we got a little segue. But... Oh, we um we here in the we here in the temple are perfectly prepared to segue and and all day every day because um. We don't go. We don't go in with a plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should. You should know the big. You should know the big secret of game design. We're all making this up. <laughs> I mean, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I just, um, you know, like I said, I thought I thought it. It, it was a a really cool concept with uh, you know the whole ancient aliens kind of a what if you know mm-hmm. background to it, and and I. I just approached um, all those ancient stories that sounded so fantastical uh, as if they were, you know, uh, true, uh, like it really happened. And and what what kind of a game world would that be, you know? Um, and uh, it was, um, you know, kind of easy and uh, a little interesting and, and fairly easy actually to to kind of progress with that in mind and. Uh, it, it just kind of wrote itself, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, when now when it comes to when it come when it come ah when it comes to this current Kickstarter, um, you had mentioned that you weren't happy with the general design of the of the original book. Is it just in in how in how it was presented, or was there something else? And what are you planning to um? to address when it comes to when it comes to design yeah um so yeah mainly it was just you know kind of the aesthetic look of the book um you know listen i'll I'll be honest i um you know that was was the first thing i've ever published right Mm -hmm. um i did most of the editing myself um without the uh you know, help of anything like Grammarly or anything like that at the time, right? Uh, I typed it up on Word, and you know, it was like a uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know how many thousands of pages of uh, you know uh, of Word docs it was, but um, you know, it started out on uh, cocktail napkins and scratch paper, and then I typed it. I actually went to Barnes and Noble, and I would go there every day and uh, sit for a period of time and, and uh, write everything out by hand. And then I would go home and uh, type whatever I'd written, you know, up as a document and kind of uh, tweak the spelling where I, where I could and, you know, change things around. But um, I had no idea how to properly do a layout or um, anything like that. And I, and I didn't have Adobe InDesign, uh, you know, that, that program at the time was like $10,000 and, uh, that was way out of my budget. So uh, I found a student that had it on their computer. Uh, you know, they get a, they get a, they're able to rent it or whatever from the college for a certain amount. So, uh, I paid them some money to put it up on InDesign and, um, you know, get it all uh, laid out and everything. And we said, well, I'm going to need some pictures, you know. So I went to Deviant Art and uh, found a bunch of artists that I felt, you know, I kind of liked their style. And uh, I just approached them and said, well, how much would it cost for you to do this? And uh, a lot of times it'd be way too much, <laughs> you know, but then you kind of negotiate with them and say, well, would you lower it if I commissioned you to do five pieces instead of one? And, you know, usually they would. And uh, I slowly built up all the artwork for it and kind of put it together myself, me, me and uh, uh, basically a buddy of mine. And I got a, uh, a girl that I knew 
that was an English major at the time. And so um, she skimmed through the book and, you know, to do some, some editing, quote unquote. But, uh, you know, she did that for free. And I got to tell you, you know, the, the end result, I, I, I wasn't happy with it from the get go. But it was so much work to get to that point. You know, once everything was created and the Kickstarter had funded and people were waiting on the book and, you know, it was just kind of something that I, I said, well, you know, uh, the the enemy of good is great. Right. You know, so um, I, uh, I just went ahead and, and put it out as is uh, thinking that I would go back and, and possibly change it later. And, and, you know, years went by and I just never, never did it until now. Um, and so basically what I'm, what I'm doing now is uh, re-editing the book. Um, I am running, uh, you know, whole chapters through Grammarly and some things like that to, to change the, uh, uh, you know, so that the flow of the, of the paragraphs is a little better and it, and it reads better and, and take out all the spelling errors and, uh, there's whole sections. Uh, there's sections in that book that um, I like to say it has like a you know like a whole paragraph will take a whole page. And so uh, when I typed it up, I had breaks, I had par paragraph breaks in it. But then when I submitted it uh, to the editor, and then they submitted it to the guy who put, the, put it together in Adobe InDesign, for some reason. The page breaks and the, and the paragraph, paragraph breaks uh, were missing, and so it, it jumbled everything together and it just compacted everything. And uh, so, one of the complaints that the people have given is uh, with the old book is that it's hard to read uh, because they don't know where to start and stop their sentences, and uh, you know it's kind of hard to pick up where you left off or find information that you had been looking for, you know, previously, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, so I'm, I've gone through, and where I could, I've broken paragraphs up. Now, I, I haven't been completely successful with that thus far because in order to keep the book at a certain page count and uh, stuff like that, you've got to consider, you know, every time you break the page where the paragraph's up, it shifts everything after that further down. Well, that means that any pictures that you had in those spots are now going to be vastly, you know, shifted themselves into different areas. And so you have to rearrange everything. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it's a, a work in progress, but I'm uh, I'm trying to re-edit it. We added something like 100 new images, um, albeit most of them are small, you know, clip art kind of images. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, I I felt that the original book didn't it didn't really uh, have the theming that i was looking for you know it it's based on sumerian culture and yet there's there's not really anything sumerian in the pictures per se i mean not all of them mm -hmm. and so uh, what i've done is uh, we changed the page background um so that now has sumerian uh cuneiform writing on it and uh we added a lot of uh, clip art that was Sumerian styled, and uh, you know we've, like I said, we were, the the tables that were in the original book were horrendous. Um, I typed those up on on a Word document, and we basically didn't do anything different to them, and and imported them into uh, Adobe InDesign, and uh, I just thought they looked like trash, you know. So, <laughs> so anyway, we've redone those in a professional manner. And, uh, you know, I'm adding uh, an index and a glossary um, because I've been told multiple times that uh, the nomenclature in the book uh, is somewhat hard to follow because it uses a lot of Sumerian words and a lot of, uh, you know, alien terminology. Mm -hmm. uh, and so because that's a little hard to follow, uh, I'm adding a, a, an extensive glossary to the back of the book. Um, and so it's, uh, it's stuff like that, you know, it's, uh, we're, we're redoing the, basically the page design, the layout, editing, it's, it's taking the same book, 
but essentially redoing everything that's necessary to print a book, you know? Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the original, you know, the course of the, the original book was a core rules book, so it included everything that a player or a GM would need. Uh, the problem is that I've added like 100 pages or, or, or 150 pages of content uh, because of spacing everything out and adding new pictures and that sort of thing. And so the book became something like 450 pages. Or, you know, it's, so it was too thick. It, uh, the, uh, when you print a book that thick, uh, the spine has a, uh, a real chance of breaking and the pages tearing out and that sort of thing. Uh, it also becomes very expensive to print. Um, even at 300 pages, it's it's almost $20 to print a book. Mm -hmm. uh, so my profit margin is very slim. Well, on a 400-some-odd-page book, it was going to cost $45 to print the book. Well, there's no way. I mean, after shipping and, and uh, the, the cut that, you know, the distributor takes and the, whatever store you're putting it in, I would literally lose money on every sale. So I had to split the book in half and go with a, a GM's guide and a player's guide. Um, and, uh, you know, I know uh, people are probably thinking, oh, well, he just did that to sell two books and make more money. Um, but, you know, like I said before, it's, it's really, it really wasn't that going into it. It was, uh, the fact that a single book that's too thick is is just going to be too expensive to produce and, and too unwieldy to use. And um, so, you know, so those are the, the, the basic changes. Um, also, uh, there wasn't that many rules changes, but there's a, there is a rules errata that kind of developed over the course of a few years. And uh, I'd put that information on... Uh, drive through RPG, and it is a free PDF download. But uh, I decided to take that and integrate it into the new books. So, you know, the the uh, new books will have all the rules changes that uh, you know people would have expected to to find in the rules errata. Mm -hmm. And with the now, with that in mind, would you consider this to be a second edition, or would you consider this this to be a director's cut? Yeah, I I don't know. Uh, I I really struggle with how to classify that. Um, you know, I've had people tell me that it's not; it can't be a second edition unless there are more extensive rules changes, and generally, a new cover. Um, and I did elect. I put. I put as a stretch goal on the Kickstarter to uh, to have the cover redone by a professional artist. Um, uh, his name was uh, Den Bouvace, who mm -hmm. uh, he did a lot of work for uh, ESR and Wizards of the Coast back in the old days, and he, he was famous for having done the uh, the Ravenloft covers. So uh, I was very happy to have him agree to to do a new cover. Uh, but to be honest, it doesn't look like that stretch goal is going to fund. Um, and, and even if it did, I was I was basically allowing it as a um, an alternative cover. I was still going to print both books and have uh, the uh, you know you'd have the option of of getting whichever cover you preferred. Um, because I don't I don't hate the artwork on the uh, original cover. Um, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I, I, my thinking was essentially, if I'm making a new book and I'm redoing all the editing and this and that and the other, I mean, should it should it have the same old cover? I don't I don't know. Um, so I'm a little at odds with that myself. I I, I don't quite know if I want to commit to calling it a second edition because I don't know that it's different enough rules wise, but it it certainly will have a different aesthetic appeal i mean it i think the book uh in its new form looks a lot better you know mm -hmm. so um, you know right now i that's why i kind of uh mix my words on the uh, on the page if you notice i uh, i do say second edition in the title but then i say uh, uh you know updated revised version you know and that sort of a thing later so 
Um, I think that probably fits better is that it's a, uh, a revised, you know, director's cut, if you will. Yeah, that's that I've, and I've seen, I've seen revised, I've seen when I, when I mentioned director's cut, I calling it a revised edition is kind is kind of what I was, um, leaning towards. Um, and truth be told, not all multiple editions of RPGs are as extensive. I think when, I think when people were making the assumption that you were making, um, they're thinking about the differences between D and D editions, which that's yes, one angle. To, that's one angle to take with it. But you look at the different editions of, mm -hmm. say, Savage Worlds, and the um, the core hasn't changed that much. There's a few. There's a few things that have. There's a few things that have been tweaked from, say. Explorers edition to the current adventurer edition, but it's not. But it's right. not like the baby got thrown out with the bathwater. Um, right. No, I think I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, you know, most people who, you know, their 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 preconceptions of what a, a second edition should be, uh, or a change in any edition, uh, would be kind of you know what D and D has done. Um, and I think that makes sense. Uh, you know. Er, D and D is the, you know, the grandfather of all games, and that's they're kind of the first uh, game that started doing that. You know, where they, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what their motivations necessarily were uh, altogether. If it was just to make a new product to keep it relevant and and sell something new, or if it, or if they legitimately thought that, oh, well, this doesn't work, let's fix it. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure, but it does very. I mean, you know. First edition to second edition to third edition to fifth edition, you know, fourth and fifth, uh, they're all very different from each other, you know. So there is a uh, a distinct difference, you know, certainly between first edition and fifth edition. So um, I, I think that's what I was kind of basing it on. I was like, well, I don't, I don't think there's that big of a change. Uh, I just, I just think it, it certainly cleaned up. It's a little more professional and. Um, you know, I hope it's, uh, it, yeah, I just want to present, I think this is the game that I wanted to present, you know, several years ago. And, you know. Yeah. And with the, with that kind of thing in mind, uh, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Well, uh, ass assuming that I don't, uh, yeah. You know, assuming that the um, the new cover art does does not get funded, uh, you know that was going to take an extra three or four months, you know, for him to do that. Uh, so if that doesn't get funded, uh, the remaining changes to the book could potentially get handled. Uh, I mean, within like a thirty day window or so, uh, maybe a little longer. Um, but I think, I think it would get fulfilled fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, I've already gotten, you know, the book has, has already been, uh, proofed. It's already, I've already sent it, uh, to get a, a proof copy and approved it. It looks pretty good. There's a couple of little issues that I want to, you know, change with it, but, uh, nothing major. And so that along with, um, a few other things that have actually come into light uh, just since the Kickstarter. Um, you know, when I get with the, uh, the editor and uh, get everything together, I mean, I, I can't imagine it would take more than, you know, uh, three or four weeks, maybe six weeks at the most to, to get all that together. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, at that point, I, I, I want to wait, uh, you know, I want to wait at least, 30 days uh, for sure before I release it to the public uh, just because I feel that, you know, when you back a Kickstarter, um, you know, there's a couple of things that you kind of expect. You need to, you need to get some kind of a discount ab above and beyond what, what normal people would pay at uh, retail. And then uh, generally it's, you know, it, you don't have this exclusive feeling if the book is available everybody else the same time that you get it so i i want to let the kickstarter backers get their stuff first um 
you know, fulfill all that and then uh, and then go ahead and w- once everybody's taken care of, then I'll I'll go ahead and release it to the public. Mm-hmm. And with and with that with that said, I do want I will um I will give you my congrats for it for it managing to get past its its initial goal. Um. Yeah. Thanks. And as far and as far as the as far as the rest, um. I know these things are kind of in flux, so in lieu of not jin- in lieu of jinxing, <laughs> right? We'll knock on wood here. Uh, look, oh, look. All I'm saying is that there are no atheists in foxholes, and there are even less atheists at the di- at the um, gaming table. <laughs> I'm not sure I know what that means, but okay. Everybody is su- everybody is some level of superstitious, especially about the dice. Oh yeah, 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 definitely. And and um, well, the, well there's the uh, I can't speak. I can only speak for my own table, but there's the unwritten rule that you never touch another man's dice. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, back in the day, we had a guy we we used to game with that uh, he would literally, uh, yeah, he he <laughs> he took it so far as like if you touched his dice, uh, he would get you in like uh one of those Indian rug burn locks, you know, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and everybody else at the table would would just let him. They'd be like, "Well, you you did it. You know, you should have known better." Mm-hmm. And with the but with all the, with all that said, I'd like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Well, thank you very much. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I yeah, often definitely. say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> All right. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gimming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody!